believe me when I tell you, she's the history of show business. Every phase of entertainment for literally 87 years paved her own way. She was no pushover, that's for sure. Was she stubborn? Was she sweet all the time? Was she a pain in the ass? She was all of those things. The minute she was born, the doctor slapped her and she started singing. She was a star at four. She was the biggest singing star in America. Before Shirley Temple was even born. She didn't sound like a little girl. Somebody put a long box in there. Once in a while, she would mention some of the tough guys she knew back then. You're working for the, the mob, the so-called mob. They treated her like a daughter. She opened the flamingo for Bugsy Siegel. She was crazy in love with him, and he was crazy in love with her. And there was a lot of problems. She developed a well-rounded character that everybody loves, Sally. That show was surrounded with guys. And we made jokes about the fact that nobody took into account the fact that she was a lady. Here was this woman fighting for her position in the show and in real life. They didn't move like their age. And they're sold out. They were rock stars. And what was going on backstage? Chaos. Any performer is good as their last show. She's never stopped working, ever. In her case, it's a drug. It's something that she has to do. You can't be in the business all your life without being tough. And she's the only one left. Rosemary. 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 Can I tell you this story? Are you rolling? God love you. God love you. Thank you. Guys, thanks so much for being here. Congratulations on the film. Uh, I complimented you highly on it backstage. I loved watching it. I loved listening to Rosemary talk, her stories, everybody talking about her. It's just a, it's a really great time, and it's a great story. Talk to me how you first got acquainted with Rosemary. When did you want to start making this movie? Well, Rosemary kind of came about very fortunately. I was, we were playing with the idea of making a film that sort of traversed the history of entertainment and kind of how we got where we are now. You know, I mean radio to Netflix is quite a, quite a journey. And so I, I, I really was thinking, originally we were thinking somebody like Mickey Rooney. And it didn't work out. And I was steered in the direction of Rosemary by a wonderful man named Harlan, her publicist. And he started telling me stories about her. And I thought, if just 5%, 5% of these stories are actually true, this could be the greatest film I'll ever make in my life. And it turns out, not only are they all true, there's way too many to fit in one movie. <laughs> so Rosemary kind of, um, she became the ability to tell the entire history of entertainment as it stands today. But also... Right from vaudeville to, to now, yeah. Yeah, exactly. But through one person's eyes. And it happens to be a woman, which I think is really, really important. Um, and it's untold. You know, it's an untold story, which... Uh, and and that, that's one thing, I mean, uh, I want to talk more about the specifics of the movie, but, uh, uh, you know, saying as a woman it's incredibly important. That is one thing that is so fascinating about watching the film right now in this particular time in terms of how we talk about women in the entertainment business, how they are treated differently, how men make more, and yeah. Rosemary's story and how she dealt with harassment at times and how sort of she dealt with a completely different power dynamic in her career. Right. You know, it's uh, I point out the irony that three men are up here talking about how important it is that women <laughs> are represented. But, but I will say, th this film, my wife and I made this film. She wrote, you know, she wrote it and produced it with me. It was ex incredibly important for us to show a person, an, entertain an entertainer who was on equal ground with everybody. I mean, she didn't take crap from anybody. For so did everything. Everything. Like, yeah. She sang, she danced, she was on television, she was in movies, you know, and she was surrounded by the mob. And I'm not, I mean, this is not like, you know, she played in Vegas and the mob was around. I mean, I'm not kidding. Al Capone, you know, was her, like her Uncle Al and Bugsy Siegel and all this stuff and her father. Her father was in the mafia, yeah. Exactly. So you, you have this kind of a person surrounded by those kind of people. I think you can figure out where this tough character, Sally Rogers, on the Dick Van Dyke show came from. I mean, you have this, this particular person who, I, like I said, happens to be a woman. That's Sally Rogers' character. It was the first woman on television to not be a mother, 
not be a wife, not be a daughter, not be a maid. She was a writer in the writer's room. And that is so important because she walked the walk and really just did it. And I think it's really important for especially young women to see somebody like that, that never complained, did the work forever and ever and ever, and just is still doing it. Because that's how stuff gets done and gets, you know, changes made is by watching somebody who's a great role model. Rosemary is that. So when it, when you, you mentioned the mob. This isn't a question. It's just one of my favorite parts of the movie. Someone's talking about working for the mob in Vegas, and they're like, they were great. Yeah. You always, if, as long as you did what you were told, you got paid on time, they were great people to work with. Yeah. Peter worked well, the with best, the mob. Actually. You, you worked with the mob, too. I worked with the, I've been in show business uh, 76 years. And uh, Vegas. Amateur. Uh, without Vegas, uh, a lot of us would never have been around. They treated us wonderfully well. There was a guy by the name of Mo Dalitz who uh, was like my surrogate father, really. He, uh, I knew, I met first met Mo when I was in Huntington, West Virginia. He owned across the river at Chesapeake, Ohio. He had a gambling place, and uh, I met, first met him there when I was 14. These people killed people. You know that, right? Uh, no, let me tell you about these guys. <laughs> <laughs> They were not into prostitution. They were not into drugs. Liquor and gambling, that's what they did. Now, that's all legal today. But in a lot of, you couldn't gamble in Ohio or what, they had gambling joints and they sold liquor. That's what they did. And uh, if you messed around, I, they would kill you, I would imagine, yes. But uh, I never saw that side of any, well, I, I met a couple of guys that I wouldn't want to mess with. But <laughs> Mo was such a gentleman, he really was. And when he came, uh, he, I opened the Desert Inn in 1950. I did a comedy act, Noon and the Marshall. And I have the, the billboard and everything. It, uh, he took over for uh, Wilbur Clark, who went belly up. So he came in, and it still said Wil uh, Wilbur Clark's Desert Inn. But it was run by, uh, he was out of Cleveland, by the way, your hometown. That's right. Yeah. Cleveland. And uh, he was from the Cleveland mob, but, but he was a, really a gentleman. And he treated us so wonderfully well. And for the most part, they all did. And uh, I can remember, we opened the DI, we would go in for four weeks. He said, where are your kids going from here? I said, we don't have anything. He said, stay right there. He said, you opened the Beverly Hills Club in Cincinnati in four days. They would get you jobs, and they would take care of you. And we were all good kids. We didn't really drink too much. We certainly didn't gamble. We couldn't afford that. We didn't mess around with any of their girls. <laughs> uh, if, you, if you were a good guy, they treated you wonderfully. And uh, in fact, I even say it in the film, I don't know what I would have done without Vegas and Reno and Tahoe, because that, you know, I have four children and, and that really, they really raised my children for me. It's a, it's a different story, but I'm curious, you, you remind me of the end of Casino now, where all of the sort of old gangster run casinos collapse and these sort of big corporate chains And it pop just up. ruined everything. It did ruin it. How yeah. did it ruin it for performers? Well, first of all, you, you don't work four weeks anymore. You go in for two nights, maybe. And then they, they would, uh, like Caesars, used to be a great place to work. But now that you go in, you'll see Celine Dion for 18 weeks and then Elton John. For, it, it for, for the acts that were in the middle ground, they weren't huge stars, but we were quite well known. It, it killed that Shecky Green and, you know, all those guys. Uh, they used to work every week. And now it's two days here, three days there. And, and I don't know if you've been to Vegas recently. Of course, that terrible tragedy, but... Uh, it, it's just not the same. You can't even walk down uh, the main street anymore. You have to go up and around. You, and you know, when, when I worked in 1950, I mentioned this in the movie, there was one cab driver on the whole strip. His name was Louis. And uh, we, we just had, uh, you know, we had uh, the Flamingo and the DI and where the Sahara was, it was called the Bingo Club and the Last Frontier and the El Rancho and that was it. And, uh, you know, if you were a performer in Vegas in those days, you couldn't pick up a check. I don't care where you were. They took care of us, these, the, the mob. And so uh, I have nothing bad to say about all those guys. There's actually a lot of, I mean, not just the... They're uh, dead, Peter. You can say whatever you want. No. But not, not, not just in Vegas, but there's actually, I think, a, a lot of people remember industries run by the mob at a time with a certain fondness depending on where they are where they were on the side of the mob because they did this interview is turning into something completely different i will take it back to rosemary yeah. but they like you said they took care of the people it was a much more personable business it was it, you know everybody kind of knew each other rather than the sort of corporate lawyers and agents and managers yeah. handling everything it all started with howard hughes by the way he's the one that ruined the whole thing he came in he, he bought 
he bought the sands, he bought the desert inn, he lived up, uh, and, and he was the first corporate guy to come in and take over. And uh, it, so he was the catalyst for, for, the, for all the, the corporate guys to come in. Peter, take me back to the first time you met Rosemary. I've known Roe practically all my life. Uh, she's 94, I'm 91, so there's a three-year difference. And I think we probably met, I'm trying to, I was trying to think the other day when we first met, probably in our 20s, yeah, and uh, we used to, I'd follow her into the Chase Hotel or wherever, you know, and she would follow me, and we became friends. And we weren't really close friends until uh, Squares, I guess, which is... The se early 70s, mid-70s Squares started, or was it even... Uh, squares, no, 60. Wait, 60. Yeah, 66, I started 66. Squares. 66. Yeah. Wow. I'd been here on Broadway. Uh, at the, I just, I'm staying at a hotel right across from the La Fontaine. I was in a show called Skyscraper with... My leading lady was uh, Julie Harris, and it was the only musical she ever did. Charles Nelson Reilly, Julie Harris, and myself. And it was not a huge hit. We ran about a year and had the most fun year of my life. And uh, I went back to L.A., and I was going to do Breakfast at Tiffany's. Uh, and uh, they offered me this game show. Uh, I, 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 somebody said they were looking for a straight man, and one of the... Uh, uh, producer's wife said, well, there's that Peter Marshall. He used to work with Tommy Noonan. He's a straight man. And so they had done a, uh, they had done a, a pilot with Burt Parks a year earlier. And they showed me the pilot, and I said, why aren't you using Burt Parks? They said, we're looking for a complete non-entity. I had been <laughs> in the business 25 years. You're you the non-entity. <laughs> but uh, I didn't really want to do the show. I wanted to go back to New York. I had a girlfriend, a uh, dancer here in New York, and... Uh, so a borough said, well, it's only 13 weeks. Why don't you, we're not going to be ready for a while. So I said, okay. And uh, I don't want to do this damn show, gum game show. And uh, the 13 weeks, they picked it up. I called Abe and he said, I was just going to call you. He said, well, I, I'm going to do another 13 weeks. He said, they want to go blonde. I said, what do you mean? He said, they want Richard Chamberlain. Well, they never came in and I ran 16 years. So you never know. What was it like working with uh, with Rosemary for those 16 years on Hollywood Squares? Rosemary is my buddy. She's my pal. And I knew Bobby. I knew her husband well. I know Noopy when she was born. You know, well, it was everybody on that panel. It was a familial kind of situation. Wally Cox. I went to PS 165 on 109th Street with Wally Cox. He was a year ahead of me. Cliff Arquette played my brother-in-law's mother on did, radio. Did you did you ever fight with Rosemary or argue with her ever? Never. 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 I've never had an argument with Rosemary. You're the only per well. I know. But uh, I mean, I mean, no, no one's ever argued. Have you ever been privy to her arguing with someone? Uh, she's demanding. I've never really heard her argue. She's very demanding. <laughs> uh, but I was never in a position to hire her. Peter's a straight man. You know. <laughs> but uh, no, Ro never gave me any problems. Not a, not a, not a problem. I, I, she's my, we're really close friends. I love her to death. She's like a sister to me. And, uh, and I knew Bobby. Bobby was a great trumpet player. I, I worked with him uh, on the NBC orchestra when I did uh, Bo Bobby Power. is her, her husband. One of the main hearts of the film is uh, her very talented jazz playing, um, trumpet playing husband. Yeah. And uh, their love story in the film. Anyway, uh, so it's it's a familial situation. I we're like fam. I just I see her still today, and and uh, we're good buddies. And she's a great broad. She really is, and uh, she is so talented, man. She she can do it all. And and Jason captured it all in the film. People, you must remember, at the age of four, she was the biggest star on radio. The baby Rosemary, you know, and she was tough. But hey, Sophie Tucker was tough. Uh, Bill Barth was tough. Jean Carroll was tough. These are all early women. You know, uh, one of my closest friends, uh, along with Roy, is Kay Ballard. And Kay is tough. Yet yeah, they had to be tough uh, because nobody treated them too well. Well, that's what I was going to say. I mean, you ask, you say demanding, or you ask, like, if, if you saw her having arguments. And I can't imagine a woman in the industry at that time not having to be tough, not being willing to, you know, you almost have to have a knack for confrontation to make, to make sure that you can get by a lot of the time. Yeah, well, I think, I think it's, there's, there's an unfairness when a man stands up for themselves in a situation where they think they deserve it or they deserve it. They get credit for it. When a woman stands up for it, often people are like, well, that, that person's being 
bitchy right. or whatever, you know. How, and Rosemary, I think, could care less that people would oh, think Oh, she was that. fearless. Fearless. And I think by the time she got to squares, she was respected as somebody whose opinion math matters. I mean, she, she literally, and I've heard this from everybody across the board, best timing in the business. And I mean, really, like Dick Van Dyke, and I've done Q&As with her where I am astounded by how fast she is. Her wit to come up with things. And I think after the Dick Van Dyke show, I don't think anybody had any doubts about her absurd talent. And um, I mean, even that scene But she that did have to fight. She had to fight hard her whole life for her parts. I mean, she is, in my personal opinion, the only blue collar showbiz star we've ever produced. Because yeah, at times of her life, she was very famous. But she always knew that's gonna end and I gotta get another job. And she always kept working. And she's an inspiration for that reason to me and uh, you know, a lot of people. You know, you talk about her timing in that scene that you have at the end of the film where she's accepting the Shirley Temple Award and she's giving that hilarious speech. Right. Her time, her, she's like, no, what, 92, 93 giving that speech? 93 giving that speech. And she just basically, her she was just, unbelievable. I want to tell a joke. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, she's, she's uh, astounding. She really is. She's in a wheelchair. You know, she can't maneuver like she used to. But her brain is as good as ever, you know. And she's still funny. And it's still caustic as hell. You don't want to mess with her. I, I really think it's important that, that Rosemary is a story that, you know, you, she represents a thousand other great stories, too, that haven't been told. And to be able to tell this kind of a through line through one person, it's important that these stories finally come out because she was everywhere. To me, she's kind of the Forrest Gump of show business in the way that she was at... The, I had an important place every time it started, you know, whether, whether it's Vegas or the dawn of television or radio or vaudeville. I mean, how many vaudevillians are left in the world? Maybe two yeah. who truly played on vaudeville stages in New York City and things. I mean, it's just this stuff is important and history is incredibly important. And I think my generation is some of the worst at remembering, you know, why certain things exist. And there'd be no Big Bang Theory. There'd be no Cheers. There'd be no any of these shows if it wasn't for the Dick Van Dyke show. And if it wasn't for Sally Rogers and the character that Carl Reiner wrote, you wouldn't have, God, I mean, I don't think you'd have Golden Girls. You wouldn't have any of this stuff. So it's really important to kind of know where, you know, B came from. You know, you need to know A. And I think it's uh, how, how respected she was at all of these different points in her career is, is fascinating. You know, she talks about Carson and Jerry Lewis and being around that whole crew, and she calls them angels and says they were amazing to her. Right. You know, there, there are many who would say that they weren't, but they were that to her, yeah. you know? I think she was absolutely loved and respected by everybody she worked with. Yeah, if you get to the top, especially people like, I mean, Jerry Lewis definitely had... A few people had some knocks against his personality. But I think when you rest get to the... Rest in peace, sir. Yeah, rest yeah. in peace. I think you, when you get to that top of, the, top of the mountain of talent, it also comes with a lot of pressure, and you become jaded. But I think that the top of the mountain looks at Rosemary as absolutely the most astounding talent. I mean, Dick Van Dyke, he looks at her as, you know, anytime he needs, he's off. He talks to Rosemary and says, you know, what... You know, on the show, she was the one who guided everybody's pacing. She was the drum in the band that guided everybody's jokes, guided everything, the way she moved. And, and Maury, blocking. too. Yeah, and Maury Amsterdam, yeah, absolutely. Maury Amsterdam. They were really, uh, they, were, they were the solid ones. And Van Dyke finally found his feet, as did Mary Tyler Moore. But to begin with, it was really uh, uh, Maury and, and, and Roe that they, 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 were the, they were the guts of that show. Yeah. Let's get some questions from our audience here. Who has a question? Right here. Hello. Hi. So you turned, you wanted to turn down uh, Hollywood uh, Squares. Pardon me, do that again. Uh, you wanted to turn down Hollywood Squares. Why did back I turn it down? You wanted to, right? Because yeah. you, you only thought it was going to be for 13 weeks. You had a love interest in New York. And I'm wondering, do you think you would have been Peter Marshall, you, would, you are today, if you would have turned down? I the would show? have been a huge Broadway star. <laughs> I'm being facetious. The biggest. <laughs> I have no idea what would have happened to me. I, but I've always worked. I would have found something. I don't think I would have been as well known. Uh, you know, Roger Moore wouldn't have been the next Bond. It would have been him. Um, he would have been the next James Bond. <laughs> but it, it, I, I don't know. Uh, Square's sort of... I always said that I worked with Cheetah Rivera. I worked with Julie Harris. I worked with all these stars. I was always second build. I couldn't sell you three tickets. After Square's... I was on top, and I sold tickets. So it's like when I did Lacage, it was Peter Marshall and Keen Curtis. Uh, 
so, and when I did Rumors, the Neil Simon play, it was Peter Marshall and Patty McCoy, whomever. And so I, all of a sudden, Squares made me, uh, uh, I'm not, not a star, but put me uh, at a higher level. I thank Squares for many things. Financially, it, it made me independent. Yeah, and, independent. Uh, <laughs> and it, uh, it was- I've been to his house, it's a nice independent house. <laughs> I, I've always said, if if, uh, if you want your son to be something, uh, make him a successful game show host. But that's the last thing in the world I thought I would ever do. I'm a singer and I'm an actor, and uh, you know, straight man. I would never thought I would ever be a, a game show host. But I'm so glad it happened. And Peter, I'm sorry. You said you're 91. I am 91. Unbelievable! Like you are, look incredible. Oh, like, thank you. you. So much energy. Yeah, Rose, wild. Rose, Rose. Thank you. R Rosemary calls him the forever nine-year-old boy. <laughs> what, how's the forever nine-year-old boy doing in New York? Is what she says. Well, it all, it, it, a lot of it uh, is because of my Laurie, my wife. What I, I always hated older guys and younger girls. And what, I always thought that was tacky. And when I was, six, <laughs> and when I was 60 years of age, I met a 25-year-old girl and fell madly in love. And <laughs> we've been married now 32 years. So uh, uh, it's not really tacky. It's, it's really kind of a lot of fun. <laughs> I, think, I think my Laurie has, has kept my youth uh, going. And she loves me, and she treats me so wonderfully well. She takes care of me. And I have great friends. The problem with getting 91 is losing, losing people. Yeah. I have lost so many friends. And I have a place in Palm Desert. And I used to go down there and play golf. And all my buddies, there's nobody left. Uh, Frankie Randall, I don't know if you know who Frankie Randall was, but he was a wonderful singer, pianist. Uh, he passed, uh, he's my last friend to pass down there. And so you're gonna lose a lot of friends if you become my age, so uh, marry well. Well, Rosemary kind of says that at one point in the film as well. She says, I don't know, I'm why, I don't know why I'm the last one still around. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. It's, it's true. You know, I, I was at Monty Hall's funeral two weeks ago. Alex, Rebecca, and I were the only two guys, by the way, from that genre to be there. I was surprised, and uh, Monty was a close, close friend. And uh, anyway, it's uh, I still see Week Martindale. Uh, in fact, we had dinner the other night. <laughs> Rosemary, I'll tell a quick story about the age thing. Rosemary, um, she she is somebody who she has this term. I'm booked. So as soon as as soon as she's booked, has to work. You can't get sick. You can't die. You can't do any of these things because you're booked. And it's a funny term she always uses. So there was about two and a half years ago, she, was, she went through a, a, a bad health moment, you know, I think. And any time you're in your 90s and you, you have a bad health moment, you get scared. And so Rosemary said, we had wrapped up most of the principal photography for her interviews, and she's like, I don't know if I can do this anymore. I'm like, well, you don't have to do anything anymore. You're just waiting for the film to get done. I promise I'm going to work on it as fast as I can. She goes, no, you know, I just don't feel good. And I said, well, okay, Rosemary, how long do you have? She goes, I can probably stay alive another six months. I said, six months, I need three years out of you. She goes, how about one and a half? I said, well, how about two and a half? She goes, all right, three. But finish the movie. <laughs> so I'm like sitting here negotiating with her. And now from that point on, she's always been like, I'm booked. Well, how much time? I'm booked for another year and a half, right? So it's like, it's her, it's her thing. If you're on, you're on. Are you and worried now that the movie's finished? No. <laughs> okay. God, no. No, the, the woman is, uh, I mean, she's, that's her humor. I mean, she is absolutely just always on like that. And if she's booked, meaning now, what is she doing? She's promoting the film. And I'll bet you 20 bucks. I mean, she's done some voiceover for Garfield and stuff recently. I'll bet you 20 bucks another job's going to come up. She's going to go do voiceover. Oh, and, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, I mean, sure. She just, she's, more work's coming for her, and she's going to do it. And her voice is fantastic. So I'm wow, really. That's, that's, she's got, still got the same voice, you know. <laughs> Uh, let's get another question from the audience right here. Hi. Um, I was wondering what the editing process was like and if your creative vision changed at all from the beginning to the end. Yeah, it, yes. I think all documentaries that are worth making, your vision should change enormously because if not, you, you're not allowing the film to kind of transform how it wanted. I will tell you this. I was meeting with Rosemary early in the stages and she goes, you know, my husband and I shot a bunch of uh, color Super 8 footage on all the shows that I was on, Dick Van Dyke show and stuff. Would that help for this film? And I literally like dropped my microphone like, what? And so we went in the back room and I mean, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of feet of Super 8 Kodak film 
that we had to transfer into 4K and sort through. And so the processing, or the, the actual process of making this film was so much organization of home footage, because her home footage is not like yours or mine. It's not like here's my uncle. It's like here's Jerry Lewis. And, you know, this is just like they're in Vegas and Jonathan Winters is hanging out and messing around with them. And, you know, you've got, you know, the Rat Pack. You know, I mean, it's like crazy stuff like that. So we really had to go through, figure out who was in every, film, every frame of film and put it together. And then, of course, we shot, I hate the word reenactments, but we shot a lot of stuff to match her footage on film um, with period cameras and period lenses. And so it was, a, it was a very strange process of editing as you shoot, then going back and shooting and editing. So kind of writing the script as you're going. Um, but there, there, you know, you saw, you saw the film. There are, there are film of Roe when she was four years of age performing on radio. I mean, it's amazing to see. Yeah, well, she saved everything. I mean, this is a, this is a person who scrapbooked way before it was cool. And she's got a back room that has... I mean, you know, there is no... The opening of the Flamingo in Vegas, I don't think people realize how important this moment was. When Bugsy Siegel had all these celebrities, and Rosemary was a headliner on that night, there's no record of this until we went in Rosemary's back room. We've got the tickets, we've got photographs, we've got, you know... I mean, there is insanity in that room of Americana. And so to have that kind of material, you have an amazing uh, responsibility to use it right and you asked if uh, the vision changed on this film. I will tell you, we were met with a lot of people who had not heard of Rosemary or had forgotten who she was or this or that. So the film has an enormous task of trying to get the exposition out about who this person is, but try to be entertaining along the way and show the weight of it. And you know, hopefully that's successful, but our vision changed enormously to fit that. I think we have time for one more question. Hi. Um, so when you were going through all the footage, you just kind of mentioned how you found so many interesting things. Was there anything that really just surprised you about Rosemary's life that you didn't know before? Y yes. So when I set out to make this film, I thought this is going to be a great film about TV and the mob. And my wife said, no, no, no. This is going to be an amazing love story. And as we got into her life and her materials and her photos and her telegrams, which is like the first form of texting... You'll see there's a part in the film where she and her husband are sort of courting each other, and they're sending each other telegrams, like these joke telegrams, which is exactly what we do with text today. And it is, I, I put it in there on purpose to kind of show that kids have always been this way. You know, it's just the medium changes. And what changed was that romance. You know, we really, really, really turned the film into a love story, and that I owe my wife a lot of credit for finding that beautiful story. Um, but what I loved about it also, Jason, is as the eras from the 20s to the 30s, the 40s, the, the whole progression of, of, of the, the different eras and how she hung in. She was really great looking, by the way. She was an attractive, she still is. She great still is. body. And she could sing, boy, she could sing. And she, she was a comedian. She could dance. She did the whole thing. But you also see her grow in the film, which I just loved so very, very much. And then she became a character actress from, this, from, an ingenue, from a child to an ingenue uh, to a character actress. It, it, the whole gamut. It, I, I, I don't know many films that... Uh, that yeah. That's happened in, to be frank with you. Thank and it's all the, it's, it's just her. It's not an, an actress doing her, it's her. Which it's, it's, uh, and you know, a lot of these kind of films are made when somebody passes away, which is, I think, sad in a lot of ways. So to have Rosemary be able to tell her story, and she's here. I mean, I could call her on the phone right now. Um, what did she think of the film? What did she say? Okay, so I was, I've never been more scared in my life. I mean, I'm, I'm not kidding. I mean, I, I was terrified to show Rosemary the film. Because this is a woman that said to me from moment one, make an honest movie. Don't be afraid to show that I was a jerk occasionally. Don't be afraid to show the warts. Don't be afraid to show the problems. You know, don't be afraid to show the fact that I fought with Mary Tyler Moore <laughs> a lot. You know, all those things. She, was, she wanted an honest movie, which is really, really rare. No interference at all from her or her family. And it comes from trust. But to be honest, that's what scared the hell out of me. She put no guidelines on making the movie. And so when I showed it to her, I was shaking. And she... I was sitting there with she, her, holding so her hand. These two watched it for the first time together, Rosemary yeah. and Peter. And at the very end of it, I will tell you this. Rosemary and Peter had tears in their eyes. Yep. And it was the most cathartic 
thing for my crew, Jackson, John, and Mike, who are watching, and Christina. They, we all saw the response from these two. And Peter said to me, he said, nobody has ever done, and I'm saying this because it means so much to me, nobody has ever done justice to the, to the nightclub era in the 40s and during the war and all this stuff because it was never really recorded. So it's kind of forgotten that everything, you would go see a live act before, and that's kind of changed now. But that meant, it means so much to me because it's such an important part of American history. Oh, absolutely. All the nightclubs and, and how everybody used to ingest entertainment like that. So her response was, it was excellent. It was so good. Though I will say, Dan Harmon, who created uh, Rick and Morty and, and Community. Right, who's, who's in the show? He's, in the, he's yeah. in the film. So Dan, film, excuse me. and I'm a big fan of Dan. He is an incredible writer um, and a, a student of the history of television. But I'll never forget, three times during the film, she kept looking back at me going, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> and I'm like, that's Dan Harmon. He's really famous. She goes, never heard of him. You know, so it's kind of, you know. Uh, well, guys, congratulations on the film. I love it, Peter. Thank you so much for being here. Jason, again, congratulations. How can people see uh, Wait for Your Laugh? Uh, so right now we're in theaters in New York City at the Angelica and the Landmark on 57 West and expanding. Next weekend, the Bay Area, and then the following weekend, Los Angeles and uh, Pittsburgh and a few it's other It's more places. than a documentary, by the way. It's, it, it's, it is a motion picture. Uh, we saw it for the first time. With, I was with Dick and, and Carl Reiner. Van Dyke and Carl, and Carl looked at me and he said, "That's the best damn documentary I've ever seen in my whole life." And I said, "Well, you've been around a long time. You've done a lot of stuff." He, he I got him drunk first, so. <laughs> but he, uh, it, it's something that I hope you'll all see, because it's 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 quite wonderful. Oh, and like you, you said, it's not just about Rosemary; it's about the history of entertainment. It's about in it's America. about an era, well, yeah, or eras. Yeah, you know. exactly. Eras, eras of entertainment. Yeah, guys, right. thanks so much for being here. Give them a round our, of applause. Our guys. pleasure. Thank you.